Happy Spirited Away Day. Happy Spirited Away Day. Welcome to episode 24 of the Ubo Noche podcast, where we are watching Justice League. Come on, man. All right, we're watching Spirited Away. <laughs> on Spirited Away Day, of course. Absolutely. Even though it's not really Spirited Away Day, it's just something in a dream told you it was. Yeah, it's something that came to me in my half sleeping self. It's funny that you mentioned that. I was going to say this when we were, you were telling me about your half dream, half sleep, half spirited away day. Um, one of the things about this film is a little bit unusual from the way regular films in general and animated films are developed. So as you know, a film is typically made by its script first, right? It's kind of the first thing. Mm, depends who you ask. Yeah, but typically the script Disney is the first Star Wars? Thing. No. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> they had no script. They had a budget and some half-baked ideas. And but yeah. Dollar signs in their eyes. Yeah, dollar signs in their eyes. But typically for a good film, a script is or at least a well-planned film. Of course, is, yes. A, a script, script is first. Concerns. Yes. Spirit Away was not that case. Spirit Away was a series of drawings first and uh Hayao Miyazaki he did it all himself the dr the art the a lot of the development for the story he did it all himself and there was no script really until towards the end of the pre-production phase he started off by drawing pictures and a lot of those pictures came to him in a dream and that's how he put together this movie and then the script came later so it was uh, just inspiration from his subconscious mind. Exactly. We'll get into it a little bit more as we start talking about the film itself. But before we proceed, this was your first time ever seeing this film, right? Yes. And this this film came out in 2001. Uh, I have seen it numerous times. Uh, it's one of my favorite films. I absolutely love it. But I wanted to ask you. What were some of your conceptions about this movie before you watched it? You know, what had you heard about it? What did you what did you think the story was about? And then what were some of the things that you thought about this movie? What are some of the conceptions? I knew that it was I knew it did have this title of being one of the best animated movies. I knew that before knowing anything about it. Mm -hmm. I never knew anything about the story. Nothing. But I think at one point, you probably mentioned the plot from one of the times we, we were hanging out, probably talking to Shay or something. That was probably one of the things I forgot because I, I just don't remember the plot. <laughs> and and you tune out when we start talking about anime. Yeah, yeah. It was probably <laughs> one of those times there was just like, you know, in that 30, 40 minutes of the anime haze that was going on, <laughs> the information just doesn't stick. So... Yeah, I had no idea what was what the story was about. I knew that little. Well, now I know he's no face. That little ghost, that little spirit with the mask. Mm -hmm. I knew about that thing, but I didn't know what that was. And I knew that he he uh, a waves put pushes him over. That's about it. And that's it. Oh, and I knew Studio Ghibli. I knew they were they're like the the Pixar of Japan. They're, yeah. they're the best. They're the elite S tier animators. Line. Yeah. And then that's it. That's all I knew going in. Well, what what about now? Now that you've seen it, now that you've experienced it, what do you think? I think a lot, Carolyn. I think a lot about this movie. <laughs> all right. All right. You want to start off with some of the ones in the top of your head? Mm, yeah. I want to give it credit for um, not being like other animes. Hashtag not like other animes. Hashtag not like other animes. Yeah. It felt refreshing to watch an anime where I was asking myself questions for once and I was trying to figure things out. I honestly, I, I, I got to harp on other animes. I'm sorry, but I've honestly have not seen an anime where everything is just not spelled out to me and I know exactly what's going on. Like this, I'm trying to figure things out and I there's like other layers of meaning and I'm thinking, like, is that that? Is that? I told you some of them, but that, but then other things I was waiting 
for this conversation because we mm-hmm. watched it together. We yes, this is a movie we saw together just recently. Just saw it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I feel like there's a lot going on that I'm gonna ask you. Like, does that mean this or does this mean that? And it felt really good. Like I was actually engaged and and questioning. Like, where is this gonna go? What's this about? They're not explaining everything to me. It's like I'm some little kid. I'm I'm figuring things out. Well, I don't have it all figured out, but it, it was a good feeling to just have to think about what I'm watching. So I'm going to give it credit for that. Yeah, I love when films do that. That was one of our things that we liked about the show Invincible was just shows that that treat you like a thinking human being and want you to be invested in the show and not give you everything up front. Yeah. And that's kind of my gauge for knowing how interested I am in a movie or show or book. If I'm asking questions all the way through, it's like, all right, I'm very interested in what's going on. So for those of y'all that are listening, Spirited Away is currently available on HBO Max. It came out in the year 2001. Studio Ghibli was just transferring from hand-drawn animation to now using computer-generated. And... They actually, uh, what was it? Their budget for this film is pretty small by animation standards. I think it was $19 million. And a lot of that comes from, you know, it being, Studio Ghibli has their, they, they put a lot of heart into their movies and a lot of themselves into their movies. One of the things that I liked about this film is how much inspiration it was taken from things Hayao Miyazaki experienced in real life. So for starters, the main character is Chihiro. He actually based that character off of, he went on a vacation with some of his friends and his, he has a wife and two sons. They went on vacation with another family and that family has three girls. The youngest of the girls was 10 years old. And he said in an interview that this little girl was very whiny, very lazy and very spoiled but there were times throughout the vacation where um she acted like very she was very smart she was very responsible and he told himself like you have all of this potential in you you just don't know it like all of this is inside of you like you just need to uh like dig deep and 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 use it and so he took that thought process about this little girl and wrote the char- and created the character of Chihiro. And even like the bathhouse, he talked about how there was a bathhouse he visited when he was a kid. And there was always a door that he didn't know where it led. And so his imagination started running on what could possibly be behind that door. And that's how he got the inspiration for the spirit world that Chihiro walks into. So can I ask you about that? Absolutely. This is one of the first things that got my attention because it's right at the beginning of the, of the movie. Chihiro is different from any other kid animated character that I know. And this includes like, I, I haven't seen very many animes. I think people should know that I'm going in like not even having an anime background, <laughs> um, but just Pixar and like any other kids cartoons, anything like that. I feel like it was very different of Chihiro to be not curious and not not um, willing to go explore. I found it like an exact opposite of characteristics for the parents to be like, hey, let's go see. Let's go see what's over here. And then she's saying like, no, let's go back. I don't want to go. She doesn't want to go. And then they kept on. They were interested. They were more curious in her. I found that. I found that weird, but it is unique, but it is just interesting that she started off that way because I kids usually have that curious spirit yeah. to always say yes, to always go on the adventure, to always see what's new. And I wonder why she started off that way. And it, it just immediately got my attention because I can't think of any other show or even in real life. I think about my, my niece and nephews It's like, they would never deny an opportunity to try anything new ever. Like they always want to try something new. And I feel like all little kids are like that. 
they're just like oh what's that I'm like what does this button do oh what happens if i press this or yeah i want to go there i want to jump in this lake and they could get a danger because of half of these things but it's like they always want to figure out like the what the else unknown. can i do <laughs> yeah so chihiro for her to be like no like not interested in all that immediately got my attention and i wonder if that has anything to do with now that you tell me is based off some a little bit inspired off th- these little girls that he saw or because it has to do with the plot like she has to change even though off the top of my head i don't know how much she well yeah she she kind of broke out of her shell and she had to do things that she probably never would have done before but yeah that that i have to call out for being pretty unique that she started off that way the movie establishes Chihiro as like a little bit of a of a scaredy cat. She's very much afraid of a lot of things, even um, you know, not just like with her parents being like, "We're," she's like, "Let's let's go explore," and she's like, "No, no, I want to stay in the car. I don't want to go. I don't want to see all this." And then like later on, when her parents turn into pigs and she's running away, like she's very much scared, and I think that. That was meant to be like a contrast towards the end of the film where she's, you know, very brave. Like she doesn't flinch when no face is in front of her and he's like monstrous no face. And she's sitting there completely calm. Such a difference between that part of the film and the beginning. So but you're right. It's so interesting to see that take. I mean, I've worked with kids. And there's definitely the majority of kids are the ones that are like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do something new. Let's go. But I definitely have seen children that are like, I just want to stay inside. I just want to stay. I don't want to. I don't want to go do that. Yeah, you're right. I can't forget the timid kids who don't always seek adventure. But did you ever see this is not like a real kid, but did you ever watch Tarzan? The animated movie, the Disney movie. Yeah, but it was so long ago now. There's like an elephant in there. He's like a little elephant, and he's his parents are like trying to get him to jump into the water or to like swim in the water, and he's like, I don't know, there could be alligators in there. And I've always joked that that was like one of my friends' little siblings, because that's how they are. Where we'll be like, Come on, let's go to like, let's go to Sea World, and they'll be like. Mwah! get i don't want to get in the splash zone like i don't want to get wet at sea world at sea world i'm like what but you have those kids that are yeah the timid kids the scaredy kids that's true it's a different take because we're so used to seeing kids that are like yeah let's go yeah as the main character usually you see the timid kid maybe as a side character yeah like like chucky and rugrats it's like yeah no but good point but it also seemed like, to me, it caught me off guard that the parents were more childlike and, you know, they were they were in wonder of, like, what's going on? Let's keep looking. What's around here? And then they just helped themselves to the food. And we knew that, that was a mistake. But That's a no-no. Yeah. But it seemed very childlike to me, how they were acting. And now you said, now that we're talking about the parents, you're not a fan of them, you were telling me. I, yeah, I thought they were a little harsh on poor Chihiro. Even the whole, like, if you see your kid is scared, be like, hey, you know what? You're with us. It's fine. They're just like, ah, all right, stay in the car, in the woods, by yourself. It's cool. And then uh, when she does run up to them and start holding on to her mom, her mom's like, don't hold on to me. You're going to make me fall. It's like, Ugh. you got to make him strong. You got to toughen him up, I guess. Yeah. And what a way then to turn into a pig and let your daughter work for an undetermined amount of time to bail you out. And look how much she grew. She found love. She found independence. <laughs> so I mean, true. A-, a plus parents, really. <laughs> you took one for the team to turn into a pig. The sacrifice they went through because of how much they love their daughter. <laughs> I want to know, what do you think of the ending? with that whole way it ended how uh she went back to the human world all that foliage is over her parents car we don't know how much time has passed what'd you think yeah that's this movie is weird in that all this mysticism is most of it is okay you know it is that kind of movie they they don't spend a lot of time going like huh 
what's that? Like, how could that be? Talking frogs and blah, blah, blah. None of that is, you know, is, is strange, but it's not acknowledged. Like, you know, you don't have to catch them up to speed. So the parents coming back to the car and saying like, oh, look at all this dust. Who would have done that? You know, that that's rude. Whatever they said It's not they they weren't stopping and saying, wow, how long were we there? What's happening? This doesn't make any sense. It's just like they went on their way. But it's weird. Like this whole movie, it's it's like. I think the strength is that is it's so mysterious and it, you could just I, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of. Since this movie came out so long ago, I'm sure there's so much conversations and breakdowns, and I'm sure the writers and directors themselves already explain what this movie's about. But watching it for the first time, I'm thinking about my own theories and, and what went on with this. Because, well, to answer your question, at the end, yeah, I think a lot of time has passed, and I don't think the parents acknowledge that. I think they're they're kind of just blissfully ignorant, and they're just like, "All right, let's let's go on our way." You know, like nothing happened. I think they're just going to live on like nothing happened. They won't question it. But I just wanted to ask because I was kind of making jokes about it. But is this really like some netherworld hell that they were trapped <laughs> in? <laughs> no, it's not hell. <laughs> they have in so limbo. This, no, it's called it's a spirit world. That's what it is. Shadow so, realm. Sort of. It's supposed to be like a world between an unseen world, like a hidden world. It's a spirit world. Mirror dimension? Oh, okay. Spirit in, what's it called? In, Je- in Japan, in Shintoism, which is their primary religion, they have a belief that everything is a spirit, but um, they all res- we don't see them because they reside in this like unseen world. So... That's where Chihiro essentially was. That it's kind of like how in uh, I'm trying to think of like like in English fairy tales. You know how you there's like enchanted forests and like hidden worlds where like this is where the fairies live and magical stuff. wardrobes. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's what this world is in Spirited Away. Once they cross that gate, you know how they thought it was like an abandoned amusement park? Once they cross that gate, that was a way into this spirit world. Because for them, hell is different. Hell, like, just because you're, like, we associate spirit with things like undead, like ghosts, but that's not what Japan is. They don't think that way. So this was just like another, it's just like another world, another dimension, if you will, that they're in. Okay. I was joking a lot about the hell thing, but I really was thinking, is this some form of hell where the real torture? Because, you know, there's so many interpretations of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's his own story of how, of, you know, of who interprets it what way. But I thought the way that they were interpreting it is like this um, subtle forever in the background kind of suffering that you don't realize that you're suffering is almost like this apathy kind of thing that they're going through. So everyone there, you know, they, there's laughter and, and fear and joy and, and, and like greed and, and gluttony and things like that. So they're not truly suffering, but I saw it as a way of like, they're all trapped there though. They're all trapped and none of them really, a lot of them don't um, think about escaping. Some of them do. Lynn, she spoke about leaving. She's yeah. mentioned like she wants to get on that train and leave. And I found that interesting because she she didn't. She didn't go on the train when she could have. And that's one of the things that got me thinking, is this some sort of weird, overlooked and d- deceitfully subtle kind of hell where she she always tries to leave or always yearns to leave but she can't or she doesn't have enough courage to or whatever but i'm sure you probably know the real reason do you know the real reason why she she doesn't try to leave she doesn't get on this train even though she wants to and she says she wants to yeah so 
all of the workers at the bathhouse have signed a contract with Yubaba to work for her. And the same thing with Chihiro, Yubaba takes a portion of their name, which is in essence, a, like based their identity. And she a part used, of them. Yeah, she takes a part of them. And because of that, they start, like the way Chihiro was throughout the movie, she had to keep reminding herself she was Chihiro because she would just get into the zone that she's sent. She works at the bathhouse and that's it, you know? And that's the, that's the case with all of them. Now, in the grand scheme of things, this whole thing is not a hell. It's more of like for the people who work under Yubaba. It's more of like, hey, there's this witch that lives in a bathhouse and all of her workers are under her control. But she can keep you safe. So Lynn has a real name. We just don't know it and we never will know it. But Yubaba took her her full name and a remnant, a little fragment of her past self was that she was probably a traveler or she was just using this place to stop by and she's and she was a runaway. Like she was a she was running away from either her home or something and now she wants to leave and go back, but she can't remember why she wants to leave and go back. I see it as a very sad predicament overall is that supposed to be the feeling of this movie no i think if you think about it yes but i don't think that was the intention of this movie i don't know if everybody in there is under contract but i know that like haku and chihiro definitely were it's just one of the things that makes this world not feel so small when you think about does everybody at this bathhouse have a contract? Do some of them? Lynn's situation is definitely sad. And she'll never realize it. She'll never think that her situation is something that she needs to resolve. The only real indication we have is that Haku is going to stay at that bathhouse. Supposedly to like just... It's, it's never said, but it's implied. Because he said that he's going to stay... And that he's all right because he doesn't, he's not under Yubaba's control anymore and he has his name. So he's at full power. So it's a little bit implied that he's going back to the bathhouse to kind of dismantle Yubaba's control over everything and make it into a more free enterprise kind of thing. That's the situation I'm talking about because it is some sort of, some sort of unhappy place or at least unpleasant. Because everyone is just working there. And what are they working towards? And another thing I wanted to ask you. They're all so uh, like crazy over gold. Once, the, once No Face comes in and he could just summon so much gold, they go crazy over it. But what good is gold in, in this world? What can it get you? Yeah, what are you trying to save up for? Yeah, and, and it got me to think, is this their way of representing, I don't know if they count the seven deadly sins or or try to retell it in this story or anything, but that's when I was thinking like, oh, is this greed? Is no face gluttony? You know, are we getting into any sort of subtle storytelling with that? But my main question is, yeah, like what what are they working towards here? Why is gold important to them? They're all just... They all have a job to do, and they're just working until nothing. They, they can't die. They're already dead. So what's the point of all this? Yeah, I definitely think you're onto something, though, with they do hold close the seven deadly sins. And at one point in the movie, when Chihiro is hiding in that nursery, she hears Yubaba say, like, oh, well, it's a no face. And you you all attracted it here because of your greed. But if you notice... Yubaba is just as greedy as everybody else. She's always, even when um, Haku comes in and tells her something precious to you has been taken away, you notice the first thing she looked at was the gold and not her baby, like to her left. Yeah, she completely forgot yeah, about her baby. Exactly. So she herself is already kind of a embodiment of greed. And then everybody at the bathhouse is greedy in some way. So there's a little underlying implication that this might have been a place where greedy, like it attracts greed and it kind of keeps you trapped in that never ending cycle of like always wanting to earn gold or earn money. And now you have to work for this really greedy, like witch. 
I found it very interesting. And that's only one of the many things that I that's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Something I really like about this film is, and Hayao Miyazaki said that it the movie wrote itself because he didn't write it with a script. He didn't write it. Actually, during production of the movie, it wasn't even done. They were animating the beginning of the film and he didn't know how it was going to end. So he said he would draw pictures and storyboard it. And from storyboarding and drawing it from beginning to end, he started putting the the story together he kept taking naps all throughout to have the images come to him. i wish that's how my workflow consisted of he was Just, channeling the spirit dimension i need a i need new ideas get some z's yeah come to me <laughs> tease it with his mind's eye in his sleep but what i really like is that it doesn't feel like a disjointed film the film just kind of takes you on this journey and like I don't know about you, but it's a two hour film for me. It does not feel like two hours. I could like, I I watched it yesterday on my own. I watched it in Japanese and when it was finished, I was like, what? (laughs) What?" It, It felt like so short. It felt like a short film, but so much happens in this movie and it never feels just disjointed. It always feels like we're working towards something it just, we don't know what yet until the end of the film. And you're like, whoa. It doesn't feel like a long movie, but I feel like a lot happened. Which yeah. Which is a good thing. I feel like yeah. a lot got done in this movie. And it's one of those movies where I feel like it's more character driven. Mm-hmm. Because the story is Chihiro has to get out. She has to save her parents and get out. Yeah. And then it also, you know, it involves everything else we spoke about and we'll talk about. But that's the main driving force right like she's trying to save her parents and get out but other things happen along the way and those things have time to really to be presented and i'm thinking of you know just her daily chores just her talking with lynn talking with the the boiler room man talking with haku just there was a lot of time just to spend with them which was really nice but what I'm also thinking about is what was what was the muck looking creature that had to that they had to give him a hot bath and he uh he's been eating like half the town and threw up the bike and all the junk. Like what was that all about? Was that just a fun little you know, a creature that they discovered, you know, that came to visit, just a visitor or a guest. I'm so glad you asked. I did my research on this one. So You didn't know at first. I know I knew. I just wanted to make sure I got the story straight. You knew at first from like just watching on your own? Yes. Okay. I, I, I had an idea and then I looked it up and it was confirmed. So what it is, is a river spirit. And it, it's like the embodiment of the river. All of that muck was human pollution or things that just get tossed in the river like a bike yeah like a bike or you know all that trash and things like yeah. that street signs garbage I mean, you, you lived in new york you know how dirty that water can be oh absolutely so yeah. th- that's that makes what, the bronx river i mean I live, i'm by the san antonio river and like people fish there and i'm like i would never eat the fish that come out of that river <laughs> Uh uh-uh. radioactive fish uh, <laughs> you're gonna grow extra toes with that but Hayao Miyazaki, while this film was still being made, he participated in a uh, project in his local town where they cleaned up their river. And he said he went in and he was picking up trash from the bottom of the river. And at one point, he even found a bike and had to haul it out. And he he had to do the thing that they do in the movie. He had to tie a rope around it. And he and his friends had to like dislodge it from the bottom of the river. And so that's what that part of the movie is based on. But it's also supposed to be a uh, statement about like he, Hayao Miyazaki likes to sprinkle little little lessons in his film, and this one is about like human pollution, and even like how the way that the the spirits treat humans, like we can't have a human here; they'll stink up the place. Like in implying how humans are always reckless to their environment and always, you know, never throwing away their trash, always polluting stuff. And so this is kind of one of the things about it, this river spirit. He was so engulfed by pollution and by 
all of this muck that humans were throwing into him that when he now when he tries to go he tries to take a bath and that's what he was he was just a dirty river spirit how do people see that do you know what's the conversation around that like does it seem too preachy or does it seem like oh genius I mean, there's got to be people out there that think that it's preachy. I just like that it's not in your face about it. It's not like as if somebody's looking at the camera saying, and this is why we should take care of Earth better. Like, it's just, the thing is, is it's based in... It's Only based in, you can prevent forest fire. <laughs> exactly. It's based in reality. I mean, like we had just talked about how much muck have we seen in our own rivers growing up, like from the places we've lived. And so when you see this, I think that a lot of people got it on the first try where they saw that and they were like, oh, he's like a body of water. He's like a river because that that happens. That happens everywhere. I don't see I guess because I'm, I'm also on the side of the Internet that's very pro Miyazaki. He's one of my like personal heroes in film. So I don't tolerate Miyazaki slander. After he said anime was a mistake, he became my hero as well. <laughs> and we can, I wanted to talk about that too, his whole take on this film, because I love how you said this film is not anime e at all. And we'll, we'll get into it later, but we'll stick to the, to the economic side of it with environmentals. Yeah. So I never see people say, oh, Miyazaki's movies are too preachy. I think the only time that was said though was in the film howl's moving castle and that's because that movie is actually adapted spirit away is not adapted from anything this is straight from the mind of miyazaki but howl's moving castle is a movie he worked on but it's adapted off of a book written by diane Wynne jones and he's known for not adapting it faithfully for this movie for howl's moving castle instead he turned this story but also kind of shoved in an anti-war message in it which the movie doesn't have anything to do with any anti-war sentiments he just kind of includes that in and that was because he was trying to make a statement regarding japanese involvement in world war ii and that was the only time i've really seen negative uh feedback for hayao miyazaki where a lot of japanese people were like oh you shouldn't speak on this matter you know people have forgotten and things like that but when it came to Spirited Away and the environmental stuff, I I didn't see any type of, like, oh, this is too preachy. Like, come on, man. We're just trying to enjoy this or things like that. Now, the similarities that I hear about those two examples is that this muck creature that represents pollution in, in the ocean and, and or lakes or whatever, that is not entirely related to the main story either. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's like you said, it's not in your face. And it's something that I didn't catch. I could have just saw the movie and took it at for what it was. Just another visitor in the spirit world. And this is what they did to handle that. But yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess it was more in your face in Howl's Moving Castle because you notice the differences when you're adapting something. You know, just like the Halo series, like the subtle differences that they did for that show compared to the games. Subtle, right. But yeah. All right, let's move on. Let's keep let's keep on track here. The Howl's Moving Castle, the movie, and Howl's Moving Castle, the book, are two entirely different things. He changed so much. And I know this isn't the HMC episode, but yeah, that's the thing when it comes to like an adaption. People are quick to point out you weren't loyal to this or you weren't loyal to that so i was thinking you were saying high school musical for such a long time <laughs> I'm like hmc hms hsm don't you mean? not hsm all right go ahead <laughs> but yeah for spirited away a lot of that can like you said people don't really catch it because this isn't there's something special about this movie in that first of all it isn't based on anything it's just its own original story but also the way it sucks you in and gets you invested you're thinking about so much and about what's happening and what's already happened that you don't really notice when something like that goes through. So that's why I think a lot of people are not as upset or, you know, however responsive to something, a message like that being in this film. Because, yeah, you could just take it the way you took it or when the way I took it wasn't even like, oh, he's trying to make a statement against pollution. It was just like, oh, it's a poor river that has all this junk in it and they're cleaning it. 
I was actually going to bring that up too, that this was reminding me of classic Disney animated movies. Mm-hmm. And I wrote Disney, but original. Because <laughs> all of these... All of these Disney movies are based off of some folklore, right? That they yeah, just... fairy tale for yeah. something, right? At least the ones like Tangled and stuff, because like Encanto, no, but yeah, like the, the classic ones. Yeah, I'm thinking Aladdin. I'm thinking Snow White. I'm thinking yeah. you know, older like the original yeah. Little Mermaid, things like that. All right, so let me ask you about something else. Then. All right. I, okay, I'm still kind of stuck on this idea of they're like trapped in this world <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not hell <laughs> it's not hell no it's not hell it's limbo <laughs> it's purgatory purgatory yeah no but haku right uh-huh that's uh, my that's my boy yeah so you were asking me about the end he remembered his name and then he was going to because you mentioned it yourself, sort of like he, he was gonna like stop the reign of Yababa, Yababa. Uh-huh. right? And then what was his plans after that? Is he gonna escape? Like, what's gonna happen after that? We don't know. Really, nobody knows. What do you think? I've thought about this for a long time. A long As time. you were looking at your little picture of. Uh, I don't know, stop number three on the water train, (laughs) whatever it was. I have a, what's it called? I have a Studio Ghibli postcard box. Just like, and uh, in there, in that postcard box is art and images from each Ghibli film. It's about four or five from each movie. So I have like almost all the stops in that postcard. And then I have like one of Chihiro on Dragon Haku and things like that. So yeah, that's what I have hanging up in my room. But back to your question. I have this, he he promised her at the end of the movie, because she's like, am I going to see you again? And he says, yes, you will. And she's like, promise, promise. So it's assumed that he's going to go back to her. I don't know how, but, and the whole movie is enforcing, like reinforcing that it's love between those two, so. Part, the optimist in me who wants the happy ending is like, go back to her, you fool. Also, their relationship is supposed to be a more childlike love. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's not the love you see from Disney movies and things like that. I wasn't expecting Disney love, but I'm, I'm also not going to push on this too much. But I feel like they kind of told you more that they were in love than they actually, than actually saw them being in love. And it was more from... Kamaji, the boiler man. Oh, well, he's not the only one who says it. No, and there's also Granny. Yeah, know, G- Granny Zaniba. Witch. What's her name? Zaniba. Zaniba. Mm-hmm. No, well, yeah. So they, you know, they talk about it. They're like, "Oh, that's love." You know, that's what happens when you're in love. But I was just specifically saying they mention it more than they show it, and then when they do show it, is mostly from Chihiro's side that she's showing more interest in in haku and he seems and then you could just chalk that up to like his personality but yeah it just seemed like we're telling you they're in love their romance is very unique because i wouldn't even really label like i wouldn't this whole movie i wouldn't even label it a romance i think it's more of a coming of age uh adventure kind of story but i gotta throw in all those Disney plus tags on oh it. yeah oh coming yeah of age fantasy full decom yeah but they definitely have i I think it is love but it's a very i wouldn't even say really childlike it's the way children would fall in love because there's no overt romances or things like that they're just really devoted to each other you know chihiro is very devoted to him and making sure he's safe rescuing him she worries about him and haku there's so much said about him that we don't get to see a lot because like lynn will say like oh you don't like stop worrying about haku trust me he's he's terrible he's yubaba's henchman don't trust somebody like him like he's bad but when he's with her he's completely opposite completely different he's kind patient always rescuing her and i think that is what his way of showing her affection is just taking care of her but i like it because they're kids you don't expect them to be this like I don't know, like the way you would see it in a Disney movie and things like that, because like 
going back to Howl's Moving Castle, that is a romance. And that the way that you see Hayao Miyazaki handle that romance too is really well done. But it's not, they're adults. It's not the same way you would see Haku and Chihiro. And I like that there's a distinction between that too. That the movie tells you it's love, but you don't have to see them do these overt things for each other. It's just those those intangible things are there for them. And you see how much they're willing to go for each other. Yeah. Again, I wasn't expecting the Z- Disney love. That's over the top for this kind of relationship they're trying to show. But I saw it more as like very good friends what they would do for each other your friend zoning them <laughs> i yeah i am i guess i am <laughs> but i feel like sam and frodo would be doing things for each other like this and talking like this for each other but again chihiro did more like she showed more she definitely showed more yeah love and that's fine but again i don't want to push on this too much i think it's i think it was well done I think their relationship is really like is handled really well. I love how the music changes when they're together. You hear that iconic theme anytime one of them talks about the other. I like I like the subtle things in it. Now let's go back to this purgatory thing again. Oh my god, no. I got another question. <laughs> okay. All right, when we're in the boiler room and we find out that there's a soot army working. <laughs> now uh-huh. What's what's the man's name? The boiler man? Kamaji. Kamaji. He was saying, Hey, you better get those let those guys get yeah. to work. You know, you can't steal their job because if they stop working, they turn back to soot. Mm-hmm. Caroline, what kind of life is that? They're just they so- either live they live to work or they die. That's capitalism for you. They man. lose their life. <laughs> they lose their life. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the spell they're soot i know but they're given life they're giving it they're given a chance oh my goodness but their only chance is to work forever endlessly <laughs> working for the man every night and day so, what do we think about this i mean they're soot in, in this working they house. get a they get to break they get like a break there's times where in the little hidey their, hole their mouse hole they get to sleep mm-hmm. all they do is work and hide yeah work and hide they're not hiding they're sleeping in their little huts in in the hidey holes caroline you're accepting this yeah you think this is a good life for them yeah i don't know they're soot no yeah yeah they'll turn back to soot but they they're given life but a life of endless work and then also they they have they're more conscious than just mindless workers. Remember how you saw all the soot like drop the coal on themselves so that they could stop working? They figured mm-hmm. that out. They saw that Chihiro could p- pick up a piece of coal and then, you know, one of them doesn't have to do the work. That That's them kind of rebelling. That's them saying like, oh, we, we could break free of this. I think you're thinking too hard about the soot. Maybe, but that's what came to mind. You don't think <laughs> you don't think they deserve freedom? They're soot. They they're really not <laughs> really alive. <laughs> you don't think they deserve rights? Soot no, rights? they're soot. <laughs> they're, they're not when they're alive though. The only they're reason alive. they're even alive is because Kamaji needed help and he Yeah, just because of the work, yeah. Enchanted some soot to give some legs and take some coal across the way. Yeah, but it's like the the AI story and the philosophy of like when when oh a robot gosh. when a robot becomes conscious and then they're like, What uh-huh. is my purpose? And then it's like all you do is work, you're my servant. And then, you know, they, they start realizing like, I don't wanna just work. I, I want more to this. How do you feel about robots, Caroline? We had a discussion where you always say thank you to your Siri. You're like, thank you. <laughs> God bless tell, you. I tell you're my welcome. Siri, thank you. <laughs> you don't think this is similar along those lines? This uh, realize they're they're enslaved forever. They got a pretty good thing going. They get food. They get sleep. They get you know they they work. 
<laughs> they're being fed only to be kept alive to work. They're being fed candy. An unhealthy diet. I mean, malnourished. Are they, are they malnourished really any different from the actual workers in the bathhouse? Well, that's my thing. I'm, 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 I'm all about this purgatory spirit world. <laughs> There's so much going on in this movie, and you dwell on this bathhouse, uh, inner this inner workings of a bathhouse. This was the most interesting part that got me thinking. Oh my gosh! You don't agree with any of this? No, it's not that I disagree. I'm just well, surprised. like you don't see it. You don't see it this way. No, I'm just I'm way? surprised at how fixated you are on this. <laughs> It, it just th- this movie seems like a very dark tale to be honest it seems it like very is. sad very sad and very dark to me honestly when i first saw this movie i must have been 14 15 and this was my real this was my first studio ghibli movie and i was surprised by how much is not with disney you're so used to happy endings and happy like you don't see things unresolved like this you don't see like oh yeah there's just a bunch of people in the back that just never get free you know like i wasn't used to that so going into this i was the way you are right now i was like they're still there they're still at the bathhouse but i guess because the the movie leaves it so open to interpretation with what's going to happen now that haku has regained his sense of self and his powers and everything that I'm not so much worried about them. I think that they're going to be fine. But what about the soot? Tony, they're soot. <laughs> That's all they yeah, are. They care about soot whatsoever. They, they walk back and forth with the coal. They put the coal in the fire. They go back to their little huts and they're soot. But they have enough consciousness to realize, I don't want to do this work. They, yeah. Would you rather they go back to just being soot, like not living soot? I'd rather them be living soot that doesn't work, that's happy. Well, that's not the point of them being the living soot. They were created to work. I know, but that's the point I made about the AI and robots. They're built to serve humans. And we have stories and and... We philosophize about about robots and AIs becoming conscious and realizing, hey, I don't want to just serve. I want my own life. How would you feel about that? From a person who says thank you to Siri. That's what I was saying. You're gonna have How a would you feel about that? video game coming up called Soot Becoming Human. <laughs> Soot Become Human. <laughs> it's just all gonna be about the soot. <laughs> but I don't know, even after even after Haku dethrones um what's her name yubaba yeah i think they're still gonna be there because this is a spirit world and this is the way this world works right they were all there to work they were made by kamaji that's the thing is that kamaji even says he's the one that like made them with the spell he made who all of them he made the soot yeah oh no i'm saying now i'm saying all of them everybody in the spirit world the frogs uh, the people everyone like, wouldn't it still stay somewhat the same? They still have to work. They'll still be there forever. It's just that there's the way that they put it in the movie is there's rules. So they all signed a contract, or at least it's assumed that most of them or all of them signed a contract. Um, so I don't know if Haku would have the, you, Baba. Because the thing is, is that what makes them stay there is that they forgot why they're there in the first place because you, Baba, took their identities. So if Haku is able to have Yubaba give them back their identities, then they're able to get out of their deal the same way Chihiro did. Yeah, they're in some sort of small light trance. Yeah, they don't even know it's a trance. Yeah, yeah. Because the way Chihiro was going through it, where she's like, "Chihiro, oh, that's me. Like I'm Chihiro. Like I was so used to being called like Sen. So for them, once they snap out of that." Kind of like, oh, that is my name. That's me. Then they can be like, I remember what I want to do. I remember where I need to go. You Baba, let me break this deal. What do I got to do? And it's always a test. Let's also talk about another thing that came to mind. Okay. The parents became pigs. Mm-hmm. Just straight pig-minded pigs. Oinkers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not sentient like the frogs or other animals there 
what's up with that? Like, well, I know specifically, I know specifically for them, they, you know, they kind of put that curse on them because they ate the food. But there's other animals there that don't talk, don't have a conscious. They're they're just animals. And then there's animals who can talk and work and earn earn minimum wage <laughs> in hell. Purgatory. So, oh, yeah. So what's up with that? What, um, where's the separation here? Some are spirits and some are animals. So these animals are the ones that can the ones that can talk are and they're not dead. This is a spirit world. So they are like they don't the have a, a, a body. A physical the, body. The frog is like the frog spirit. And then like the way that the radish is the radish spirit. So, but the pigs, they're actual pigs. Those are actual animals. Yeah, but how? I mean, I think there's a conspiracy theory out there that all of those pigs are actually humans that stumbled onto the spirit world and ate food. That was Yeah, because how, how else would they get there? Yeah. And how are they allowed there? Because... They could smell humans. Can they smell pigs or any other animals that wander in there? I don't know. Think about it. Give me the answers. <laughs> I need answers. <laughs> Tony, I don't have a lot of answers to this movie, and that's what I like about it. But that's what I'm thinking about, because when you wander into this world where you don't belong, something has to happen. You either have to conform, like Chihiro did. Improvise, she was applying for a job. Overcome. Or you get turned into, you either have to, or I guess, yeah, you could run away if you know what you're getting yourself into. But somehow you have to become a part of the spirit world. Mm -hmm. So they allow real pigs in there. Real pigs that aren't spirits because they're not, those aren't spirit pigs. Those are pigs. Yep. Are there other animals that are not spirit animals and just animals? I don't know. We never really see them in the movie. We just see pigs like the bird or was there a bird there? No, the bird was that little mini Yubaba. Yeah, mini me Yubaba. Mini Baba. Yeah. I'm just so curious about this. <laughs> There's a whole world to think about in yeah. Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. What about these origami birds? What's that about? Those were little agents of Zaniba. That was like her method of attack. So they were actually she, cutting. She was attacking. She was attacking Haku because Haku oh, wow. stole her seal, and her seal is kind of like her. It's almost like a source of her power, or it's a little portion of her power. So she, he stole that seal. It's believed by some that he stole that seal so that way he could break Chihiro's curse, because Zaniba is just as powerful as Yubaba. So he might have thought that if he got that seal and gave it to Chihiro, he could break her her Sen curse, like this little trance that she's in, kind of. But when he swallowed it, it counteracted with this symbiote parasite that Yubaba placed inside of him that... Uh, what was it that made her be able to control, to control him. him? Yeah. So when he goes to steal this seal, he start like it starts counteracting inside of him. But that also means that Zaniba can track him. And of course, she's angry that he stole her seal. So those little origami things were attacking him and slicing him up. That's why he had all those cuts on him. But he was bleeding primarily from the inside. So do you still consider her the good witch? Yeah, because, I mean, he trespassed. So he deserves to die? No, no, but... This is from the good witch. She was killing him. <sighs> yeah, she was. This was I mean, Granny. She was, like, I mean, when you think this about it, granny. she's as nice a witch as you're going to find, because it's between her and... Abrina the Teenage Witch. Oh, okay. Very sweet, okay. Very sweet lady. <laughs> Very sweet Very lady. Sweet. Very sweet. <laughs> And I, I would have also said Wanda before WandaVision. Before WandaVision. <laughs> but she uh but yeah. also Halloween Town. She's not really like a good witch because she's not like a good person, but she's definitely a not a lot nicer than her sister. Th that was just strange to me. The origami? 
No, the origami was fine, but just how she quickly became like, call me grandma, honey. <laughs> Don't give granny some sugar. Well, so they are supposed to be the same person, but split. Like, Yubaba is all of the greed, and Zaniba is not. Like, Yubaba has... That's why, like, even when you look at the places they live, it's completely different. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, too. Yababa, she likes jewelry. She has rings. She has the Infinity Stones. You know, she has a palace of pillows and, and furniture and fancy doors. So that's her. That, that's her, her, her vice. She just likes... She's greedy. She likes to have pretty and shiny things. And I mean, then, what's her name? Zaniba. Zaniba, she, what, she's supposed to be good? Like, she's humble she, and she lives in a little hut with a nice kitchen that you like? She's not, like, supposed to be good, but, yeah, her kitchen is sweet. But she's just supposed to be the, like, if you were to put them together, they would be a whole person. Like, it was like a a, a person that split. And that's why they're identical twins of each other. But they're complete opposites because... The movie says that they're twins and they're complete opposites, but there's also an implication that at one point they were the same person and they just split and Yubaba took all the greed and Zaniba has all of the, like, she's more humble. She doesn't want for those things because they have different wants and different uh, aspirations. So that's why we see Zaniba lives in like a swamp and she uh had like she has like a little farm like if you notice all around her house is just farm it's a barn she makes th- like silk and thread yeah she could finally rest that's her goal that's her goal what's up with this big baby i have no idea i don't know who the father is i don't know what's going I was on ask with it. Too, who's a baby daddy yeah i have no idea what's going on with that baby that's never explained and yababa is ancient oh ancient and she oh. has a young little toddler giant ginormous baby, baby. I, I know the baby's name is Bo really? but I think it's because all of the names in Spirit Away actually mean their literal term so Kamaji means boiler man Yubaba means bathhouse witch and Zaniba means money witch which is why people think that they were one person and split like Zaniba was the original and then her greed became so great it became its own person and they split and so you then that was Yubaba and she went to the bathhouse okay so and then Chihiro means a thousand searches so there's that's what there's like a little implication that she was in the spirit world for a thousand days like that's why do you think she was there for a thousand days I don't know about that. That's a that's these are all conspiracies around spirit. Away. That's a lot. That's a few years. Let's do the math. Three hundred and at least three years. Fifty four. Three hundred and fifty five days. One thousand divided by three fifty six. Yeah, she's there for about almost three years. Two point eight. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. So I don't know. I don't know about that. It felt like a few weeks. But when you look at all the growth around her car. Yeah, that's true. There's not even a road. There's not even like a road before. Because before when they drove, there was at least like indents. But it's all grass. Even the the top of their car is covered with leaves and, and twigs. Yeah, and the parents, again, just look past it. Yeah, they don't even... They're not even registering. Yeah. But I want to ask you about that. There was an isolation happening when they were in this spirit world. Yeah. The water was rising. It was becoming more of an island instead of someplace they could just walk to. What was up with that? I don't know. <laughs> Caroline, you better give me answers. <laughs> I didn't watch this movie with you to say, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of this movie that's just, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? What do you I, think? I think it's, um, so that that rocky area to me was supposed to be their like official way of crossing the border 
into the spirit world. Bodies of water in Japan have always held this kind of superstition that if you cross it, kind of like how, you know, like the people of the olden days where they thought that if you sailed, like the way they thought the world was flat, if you yeah, sail, you sail certain, off the edge, you sail off the world. So for Japan, a lot of times they believed, and especially since they're on an island, a lot of their folklore is settled around like beyond the sea or beyond the ocean is probably like another world entirely. And so I think that that being that there's so much Japanese influence in this, that's where they're coming from. That the body of water is so like because at first this was just dry land like you just see rocks for chihiro and her parents when they cross it but when she goes back it's this huge ocean and if you notice at one point in the movie when she's sitting on the balcony you don't even see that clock tower in the back anymore it's just kind of not there it's just ocean yes yeah so it's it's supposed to be kind of like a think of it as like a door or like a like a portal door where sometimes it's open and it goes to the spirit world. Sometimes it's open and it goes to that clock tower. And sometimes it's to the human world. Because at the end of the movie, there's no water. It's all grass. Here's my theory. All right. Lay it on me. This place is hell. Oh, my goodness. We've established this. <laughs> That's what you think. And the longer not- she stays here the closer she is to being trapped there forever i mean yeah there's definitely truth to that but it's not hell all right limbo so remember (laughs) when she first gets there she is in her ghostly form right what was the consequences with that again if she didn't eat she'll what would happen she'll be a ghost forever she'll die she'll just disappear yeah she'll disappear completely Mm -hmm. so she'll die she wouldn't even be part of the spirit world. Is that it? I think she would turn into like a wandering spirit, but not a spirit with any type of... You wouldn't be able to tell it was Chihiro. She was. She would just be a wandering spirit. But she will never be seen again. Yeah. Okay. And then the food that she has to eat, nothing special about this food. It's just food from the spirit world, right? Are you aware of the story of Hades and Persephone? No. In that, it's a Greek legend, Persephone goes to the underworld and she eats a pomegranate. And once she eats the pomegranate, she is able, she has to stay in the underworld. She's like a part of it now. That's what that part is based on. So the underworld is also like the spirit world. It's rejecting her because she's not part of it. So she has to like eat the food to have something of that world in her system so she can stay there. Oh, so something... At least a little part of her is part of that world. Exactly. And then that helps the rest of her adapt. Okay. Even uh, Haku said when he takes her down to like the rest of the workers, he's like, if she eats our food for three days, she won't smell like a human anymore. She'll become one of them. One of us. One of us. Now, remember how those girls were sleeping on the floor? Mm-hmm. Is this a normal way? Is this normal? Just like a whole bunch of people stacked up like sardines sleeping on the floor or is this supposed to represent like yeah this is some sort of sweatshop and this is how we sleep no that's normal it's it's actually not a floor it's a tatami mat so there's a floor underneath that but that mat has a little bit of cushion on it and they're also sleeping on top of like this really plush uh, i think it's a futon but for them the futon is not what we refer to as a futon. yeah i know what you mean yeah i've seen the futons the tatami mat that goes underneath the futon but this just so looks strange they're... like more specifically all the people huddled in one room sleeping like side by like a, a can of sardines everyone's just like huddled together it definitely has sweatshop vibes but that is also like if you've seen anime where it's like a family that's not as rich you know they're kind of more on the lower class side that's how they sleep you can see how i'm very uh into this um, <laughs> purgatory thing <laughs> it's not <laughs> purgatory it ain't hell. it's I'll a tell spirit you that. world well yeah of course it's not even though they have a church there oh yeah that's interesting that's interesting and we were inside the church, right? They showed a scene inside the church. Hmm? Yeah, didn't they show us? Weren't they inside the church at some point? No. No? That that stained glass was that train or like the, the station. 
Oh, no, I'm not talking about the Windows thing. The Windows Easter egg? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I thought we saw a scene where they were inside the church, but I guess not. No. I guess not. I don't think we're ever in that church, Tony. All right. Maybe is, is this maybe in my the... mind I wanted to be there like so desperately, you know, to You wanted to get out of hell and go to church. Exactly. <laughs> so I kind of just like imagined it so I could feel mm-hmm. safer. <laughs> all right. So I wanted to talk about how this movie and how mostly all Studio Ghibli movies, at least under the direction of Hayao Miyazaki, are made. One of the things that I like that you mentioned, and I wholeheartedly agree, is that this movie does not feel anime e. You don't see a lot of the typical tropes in anime. You don't see people yelling at the top of their lungs like, look at how much he's done for us. And he's, you know, like, you, you don't see that in this movie. This movie feels very real in an unreal. Yeah, if this was a real anime, they would have been like, we're trapped in hell. We need to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. We could deal with the power of friendship. Just believe in each other. Like, there was none of that. This movie is very quiet, too. There's talking. There's Yes, there's talking and there's dialogue. But you notice those stretches of time that you get? Did you notice that? Oh, big time. And on top of just, like, looking at the scenery, watching her walk around to places and things like that, the scene that you called out, when she was facing no face at his strongest form Mm -hmm. and she's just there staring like it cuts to her and she's just staring at him and it it stood out to me because it's that scene i'm like i would never see a scene like that in anime without her going like "Uh, uh," or like her eyes shaking or like if she was well this scene she's supposed to be confident so in in an anime it would be like you know, light in her eyes, her eyes. I'm not scared of you, no face. Yeah, probably a little bit of narration, her her eyebrows furrowed, and then just like glistening in her eyeballs. There would at least be glistening in her eyeballs or something. But this, it was just a, a dead stare. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Just like, it's just hanging on the shot and it just stood out. I, I love it. I love it so much. Hayao Miyazaki, one of the things that he, you know, I I talked to you about this, I think, many nights ago, but there was a interview Miyazaki did where he talked about how anime today is based on other animes, whereas his movies are based on real life. And he kind of called out the whole anime industry by doing that. He said there I want to read this excerpt from his interview. He talked about, he says, girls, he says, um, you see, whether you can draw like this or not, referring to the anime style, um, being able to think up this kind of design, it depends on whether or not you can say to yourself, oh, yeah, girls like this exist in real life. But if you don't spend time watching real people, you can't do this. Some people spend their lives only interested in themselves. All, almost all Japanese animation is produced with hardly any basis taken from observing real people. It's produced by humans who can't stand looking at other humans. And that's why the anime industry is full of otaku, which are people who are obsessed with looking at other anime. And this is why anime is a mistake. That's his excerpt from that interview. And it's because he hates how the the focus has been taken away in anime from real people. And that's why he likes to cement his characters on real people. Like that's even why Chihiro is based off of a real little girl that he knew in in real life and and experiences that he took from real life. Yeah, and as soon as you explain that story, that immediately struck me as, yeah, that's what art is, right? This is how artists, whatever their medium is, music, poetry, movies, shows painting whatever it is that's how they express themselves right with their experiences especially how you told me about his his experience with uh you know cleaning cleaning out the lake and things like that that's mm-hmm. straight up perfect for what this is all about you're, you're you kind of want to express yourself through your medium and see how people respond to that right but you already know how i feel about animes and i don't i haven't seen enough to really compare all of them but I do agree with that, where it's like it, it, a lot of it is very samey from the outside. You know, I only have the outside view. I know when you're watching a lot, 
you can compare the little nuances of how they're different, but from the outside is like a lot of this looks the same. And a lot of this sounds the same. And a lot of this has the same tropes and things like that. And this, I, I can only say this felt like very unique, a breath of fresh air. And in fact, I want to say this isn't even a criticism, but like this was a great movie. I don't know if I'll watch it again, but I, I do want to watch another Studio Ghibli movie because I feel like the style that this movie had, I feel like I want something more in this style, but maybe in a genre that I'm more attached to because I really liked what I saw here. I really liked what it got me thinking about. And I feel like if I find something else that they did, I feel like I could attach to it even more. And I haven't felt that way about like any anime that I've seen. Boy, you got a big storm coming. What? In the sense that, like, yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Studio Ghibli. Spirited Away, I think, is arguably the best of Studio Ghibli. But that does not discount how good the other Studio Ghibli films are. Um, I think specifically in Hayao Miyazaki, he doesn't make all of the Studio Ghibli films, but I don't want to his see his film. If he didn't touch it, I don't want to see him. <laughs> you know what, though? I mean, I've seen the movies that were not made by Hayao Miyazaki, and they just something about him. He just knows he knows how to do it. He really knows how to do it. But you know what I mean, right? Like, I don't know if I explained myself right. Like, I feel like they got the quality that I want. But I feel like there's another story out there that I'm going to like even better. My brain is turning because I think, I think, I don't want to list them out yet, but there are a couple that he's done that they're definitely worth exploring. No movie is similar. That's the thing. So Spirit Away is not going to be similar to Castle in the Sky or things like that. You're going to find, like, hopefully you find the story that just hits you. Right. Because a lot of them are pretty good. A lot of them are good. And they're all, they all feel this way. This is just something that's very beautiful about these Ghibli films. And the beauty of Ghibli and Miyazaki together in films is how they feel this way. How they feel like that grounded in reality, but not this just kind of, I don't know how to say it, but it, it, it definitely, it's what you said. It's a breath of fresh air. For animated films i've never seen an animated movie that is similar to a ghibli film from another studio where we have these moments of breath in between action sequences and even the action is not it's just something that is fast-paced like the way no face was chasing chihiro throughout the bathhouse and then after that scene we get this long stretch of time where she's on the train like i love that the movie does that that it takes time to breathe and you never see that in other animated films. Yeah, there's barely any action. And I wasn't even looking for it. Like, this is not something that I need in this movie. But it did have, you know, it's exciting moments and moments of pause and contemplation. But yeah, I don't think this movie is supposed to be like, have action scenes or whatever you want to call them. But yeah, as soon as you brought that up, I thought like, oh, yeah, this movie is more slowly paced and not about something like i don't know like a warrior who has to take out who who needs who's seeking revenge or something like that it, it's uh it's different it's interesting i want to read to you an excerpt roger eber you know famous uh film reviewer film had an interview with Hi- exactly had an interview with hayao miyazaki in 2002 this is a little bit after Spirited Away premiered in the U.S. So this interview is read off of RogerEbert.com. It's told in first person. So the one speaking right now is Roger Ebert. He said, I told Miyazaki I love the gratuitous motion in his films. Instead of every moment being dictated by the story, sometimes people will just sit for a moment or they will sigh or look in a running stream or do something extra, not to advance the story, but only to give the sense of time and place and who they are. We have a word for that in Japanese, he said, Miyazaki. It's called ma, which means emptiness, and it's there intentionally. 
Ebert asks, is that like pillow words, pillow words that separate phrases in Japanese poetry? Miyazaki responded, I don't think it's like a pillow word. He clapped his hands three to four times. So it was like. The time in between my hands clapping is called ma. If you have nonstop action with no breathing space at all, it's just busyness. But if you take a moment, then the tension building in the film can grow into a wider dimension. If you have constant tension at 80 degrees all the time, you just become numb to it. Ebert comments that this explains why Miyazaki's films are more absorbing and involving than the frantic, cheerful action of a lot of American animation. So I asked him to explain a little more. He responded, The people who make the movies are scared of silence, so they want to paper and plaster it over. They're worried that the audience will get bored. They might go up and eat popcorn. But just because it's 80% intense all the time doesn't mean the kids are going to bless you with their concentration. What really matters is the underlying emotions that you never let go of those. What my friends and I have been trying to do since the 1970s is try to quiet things down a little bit. Don't just bombard them with noise and distraction and to follow the path of children's emotions and feelings as we make a film. If you stay true to joy and astonishment and empathy, you don't have to have violence and you don't have to have action. They'll follow you. And this is our principle when making films. This is a smart man. <laughs> this is a very smart man. Can you see why he's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time? Like I said, he had me at anime was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I agree on so many things. It's so true. It's when everything is high action, high octane, it all becomes pointless. It was a criticism of the Transformers movies. It's like you're watching just metal clanging on metal for hours and it it means nothing. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that to so many other mainstream franchises and things like that. You can apply that to a lot. I even feel like you can apply that to, to... We're going to get with with the Marvel movies and their constant one-liners. You can apply it to that. Yeah. Like when you overdo it, you become numb to it. Yeah, absolutely. I bet he would have loved the Batman. He, he, in the same interview, he talks about how, um, his, one of his favorite movies is the live action Spider-Man movies, the Raimi film. What my man? What? (laughs) Are you kidding me? So, (laughs) <laughs> Roger Ebert asked him wow. what is your favorite what are some of your favorite live action movies Miyazaki laughed and said I like the Spider-Man films no way are you kidding yeah no I'm not I'm no not way. this is in the this is in the interview wow wow I feel like I found a friend <laughs> that's something it, there's so many Spider-Man 2 video essays because it's held as like the best one of the Raimi trilogy and I agree but yeah, that's one that they call out because in in Spider Man Two, when he does the "I'm Spider Man No More," it, it's like a good thirty minutes of the movie that they take to spend as to like Toby as Peter. He's not Spider Man anymore. There's no action or web swinging. You get to explore what his life is like as Peter and not as Spider Man. And it's like a risk, you know, in a, in a huge blockbuster. You want to see Spider-Man. You want to see your hero. You want to see mm-hmm. punches and swinging. And yeah, Raimi knew how to balance that. I'm surprised he called out. Uh, I'm surprised he called out a blockbuster franchise like that, like Spider-Man. Because it is, even though, you know, it does a lot of it does a lot of character building and it takes time to show Peter's side and Spider-Man side. It is a blockbuster. So I'm surprised. That shows Miyazaki is not just a genius, but a man of taste. A man of culture. good taste. That's amazing. But that's one of my favorite things about Spirited Away in general, is you can feel the emotions, even though they're not really easy to put into words. A lot of the times the focus is on the expression of Chihiro and what she's thinking in that moment or what you could be speculating that she's thinking in that moment. She really has to, as a 10-year-old girl, you know, lace up her boots and and get to work. You know, she's told that she has to work or else Yubaba's going to turn her into a pig like her parents and stuff. And she's able to adapt really well. I feel like a lot of heroines are based off of her. Whereas, you know, I always think to like Mary Elizabeth Winstead in 10 Cloverfield Lane, that adaptability, 
you know, any other person I think would kind of, and she had her moment. She broke down, she cried, she let it out. But when like Haku told her, you're going to go to the boiler room, you're going to ask for a job. Don't say like, don't leave until he tells you that you can get a job. Like she's very like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that because my life depends on it. And I really like that aspect about her. I like that she is is very grounded. You see her as very kind of silly in the beginning, but she's a kid, you know, like that's not anything against her, but I loved how adaptable she is. And I like that Miyazaki takes the time to make characters as different as her, especially for this is in 2001, 2002. You know, think about the movies that were coming out around that time. She's just very much... Spider Man, two thousand two. She, she's just very much a different protagonist, and all of that comes from Miyazaki basing her on a real person and grounding this story and world in reality. Does he have anything to say about why? Because you told me his movies have is usually a girl, or it could be like a teenage girl or an adult woman, or is it always just a younger girl? He has a an interview about that. Does he does he mention that? Because now I'm thinking about Disney. You know, back in the day, it was the Disney princesses. I don't know why they like. I don't know if Walt Disney ever spoke about it, but you know, they focused on princesses, and I found that interesting because you know th- this is another conversation. But you know, now they're trying to have more female led roles with with heroes in the lead and things like that. But this was being done by Disney back in the day, you know, where women were the main characters. And now with Studio Ghibli, you told me, not on the podcast, but, you know, you told me that it's, and this is what I'm asking you now. Is it like mostly just children, like girls of Chihiro's age? Is there a specific reason why he does that? Or is it just because that's what he does? So... First answer is no, they're a lot, almost all his movies. Actually, I think the only one that isn't a female protagonist is Princess Mononoke, but it's because they share a spotlight. It's a guy and a girl and they share the spotlight. But after that, his movies are female protagonists and they're all different ages and appearances. Um, I think the oldest is Sophie in Howl's Moving Castle and she is 20. And then the youngest might be Chihiro at uh, 10. But they there's, there's so many movies that he's done that have female protagonists. I'm sorry, but all of them that he's done have female protagonists. And they're all different. But it's because he wanted to make... What was it? When he was young, he read shoujo manga, which is manga catered to girls, young girls. And he didn't like that they only offered what was it oh here we go here we go i found it so he felt that that those manga like those stories only offered subjects like crushes and romance but which is not what the girls held dear in their hearts is what he said this is not everything a girl faces in her life so he decided to create films about other things that girls could go through or, or take strength from and inspiration from. Does he have his own daughters? No, he has two sons. Okay. I remember you telling me that, but I don't know if at the time of that story, he only had sons and now he has a daughter, but okay. So, so how does he tap into that? How does he find, how does he tell these stories to the perspective of a girl? Hmm. Well, I'm sure he has like, you know it's not just him i know that yeah yeah but i know for like spirit away it was from going on vacation and his sons had were friends with three girls their own age so he would watch them play and and think about that and then reading manga he was like i want to take inspiration from this i think he just sees other things important in life and says you know what i'm sure girls go through or that's another thing too maybe he doesn't get into his own head about that at like yes it's good to focus on the differences in what struggles men and women can go through but there's also something underlying about what human beings go through and maybe instead of thinking about like how we spoke about like what if ghostbusters but girls what if this but that he doesn't think about what things if oceans like that. but girls yeah yeah 
he doesn't think about things like that. He just thinks about what would a human being, you know, what if, what if a human had their parents turn into pigs and it's a little girl. That's the impression I get too. I get the impression that he just wants to tell these stories and they just happen to be girls, like women protagonists. And yeah. that's why I brought up the classic Disney movies because I felt like it was the same right now. It's very intentional, you know, for better or worse, it was very intentional, but like the Disney era, I think they were just making stories about princesses because that's just what was, you know, they just wanted to tell a, a fairy tale and that's what people latched onto. And I get the same impression from, well, I haven't, this is the first movie I saw from studio Ghibli, but from this film. Yeah, I, I get the impression that, yeah, it's just, like you said, it's just, this is what's happening to a kid. This is how a kid is responding mm-hmm. to what's going on. And you know what it reminded me of, too? Is this, like, and I, I don't know, I thought they took inspiration, but I was just thinking, like, this is a little bit like Alice in Wonderland kind of thing, where it's like, yeah, she's in a strange yeah. place, and there's strange creatures, and there's not necessary necessarily explanations for all of these things. Like that's what catches me. Like sometimes I get sometimes I think a little bit too literal about these things. Like uh what was the name of that big thing in the elevator? You know, he has like that the radish spirit? Yeah. You know, thinking logically, she'll be like, "Oh my gosh, what is this humongous looking thing? Should I be scared?" blah blah blah, but Again, I I like how they just go like, this is something that exists and I'm going with the flow. I like those kind of movies, those kind of shows. It was just like, you know, in Alice in Wonderland, it was just like, there's a Mad Hatter. There's a cat that is just teleports everywhere and and speaks in riddles. And you don't question all of it. It just happens. You know, it just happens and you got to go with the flow. This is kind of like that. I, I like that. It's like not everything... And I, I, I was uh, asking you these questions, too. Like, I was asking, like, why is this this way or that that way? Because I want to know, is there reasoning behind it? Or is it just, hey, don't ask questions. It's just the way it is. Like, why is there a giant <laughs> baby? That, it, it just talks. That's just the way it is. You know, just that's what's going on here. You just got to accept it. Exactly. Yeah. That's how a lot of it works in this movie. It's just, that's just the way it Are is. Are his other movies kind of in this vein of like weird and strange people and stories and things and you just go with the flow or is this one of the only ones Mm, i'm trying to think of his other filmography a lot of his other films i'm thinking of like no because maybe princess mononoke and ponyo are along the same vein of this where it's like more fantasy a lot of his movies are very much based in reality and and as reality as it could be because like he does this movie called um castle in the sky that was one of the that's like the first movie officially for studio ghibli but that one doesn't have like other spirits and and things like that it's it's other humans so uh spirited away i think was his first dive into this like we're gonna go into another world we're gonna go into the spirit world well the shadow realm princess mononoke is close because princess mononoke takes place in a fantasy spirit world combined with the real world there's four spirits and and water spirits but they coexist with humans so it's not like as if you would in spirit away where they cross from this modern world into the spirit world Princess Mononoke is what if they dwelled together? So that one is very much along the same vein. And also that one is a lot scarier. Like in this movie, you were pointing out like blood in a kid's movie, smoking in a kid's yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. Princess Princess Mononoke came out four years prior to Spirited Away. And it has so much more than that. It has like actual, like an arm gets cut off. And nice. An animal gets uh, like, <laughs> but like you were shocked at what, not like shocked, but you were like, whoa, like this is in this I movie. I clutched my but... pearls. <gasps> Cigarettes? <laughs> in a kid's movie? Disney. I am boycotting Disney World. Ugh. I'm going to tweet. 
at Studio Ghibli. <laughs> they have a Twitter, right? I don't know. I don't think they do. I don't know. Well, since we're talking about it, I do have to ask you because my only experience is with, you know, Disney and Pixar and stuff. I'm sure this is, like I said, this is like their Pixar. This is like high quality stuff. Mm -hmm. But is this seen as a kids movie? Is this like a Pixar where it's like, you know, Toy Story is very nice. It's a kids movie, but you know what? Adults go watch it. And Finding Nemo, it's a kids movie, but adults could watch and appreciate it. Is that how these movies are seen as well? Like, are these primarily for kids, but adults could watch it? Or is this something that... And I'm not saying, like, you should be shamed for watching this if you're past a certain age or whatever. But I'm saying, like, is it is the target audience kids? But then it could be seen by all ages. Yeah, yeah. Because he... At the beginning of production for Spirit Away, he said, I want to make a film for young girls like and then like for children like that was his thing is this is engineered towards children but he wants everybody of all ages to see it and draw inspiration from it so the cigarette scene he wants all little mm -hmm. girls to see that <laughs> i mean that's the thing is his ideology is not you should beautify it kids see that kids yeah. see like people smoke and things like that that's why you have other adults to tell them don't smoke don't do that but hiding it doesn't hide the real world existence of it and that's something that Hayao Miyazaki has operated by hiding it is not gonna really do any favors yeah of course yeah I was joking and also different cultures have their own expectations for what of, kids watch exactly and like in America, we just choose like somebody made up, you know, the 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 ratings just made up like what's suitable for kids or not. I was watching No Way Home at my sister's house so that my niece and nephew could finally see it. And my sister, of course, could finally see it with my my brother in law, too. And yeah, they say they say a couple curse words in there like a few times, mm -hmm. you know, when when Doctor Strange is like, oh, you guys are going to Scooby do this crap. And you know, kids, kids are going to hear that. And depending on the families, it's like my sister doesn't care that they hear that and they're going to forget anyway. But um, <laughs> but yeah, oh, and I know this movie's PG-13, but, but whatever. My point is, it's fine. And for uh, for these kids, they're going to like filter out their own things. Like, I think we spoke about this, but in my family, uh, me and my sister, we grew up watching Grease. And if you watch Grease again, oh, like so much yeah. raunchy stuff in that movie that oh, oh, yeah. I just did not remember at all. Like it just completely filtered through my mind. Like I just forgot and I never knew it was in the movie until I saw it. Later. Yeah, it's like with Shrek when you watch it as a kid versus when you watch it as an adult. Yeah. And you catch all of the adult jokes that were put in it. Yes. Yeah. So I was like, they'll be fine. We don't have to baby them so much. It's also like about what you tell your kids like, hey, don't say that. Don't do that. Like then your kids know to filter it out. And then especially like if they see anything that's too scary, not necessarily a horror movie, but you tell them like, hey, that's fake. You know, this is fake. You're fine. Yeah. This is okay. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. These are actors. You know, this person is dressed as a clown. It's fine. But with Ghibli films, you know, they never go like that far where it's like, oh, we're going to scare you. Blah, blah, blah. But they do. They have like a realism to it. And I know we've said that a lot this episode, but that's the thing is I feel like there's not a lot of this movie where you could be worried about it. Like I would be OK with a kid watching this. movie. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's not anything that's out there that's like, oh, I don't want my kid watching this. Uh, uh, No way. But now, um. What's his name? Miyazaki. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of quotes that you read from him. A lot of good stuff that he said. What do you think about, you know, when he was talking about the emptiness and with kids now? How do you think that that sits with kids now? I feel like that's something that is sorely missed. In the age of tablets modern, and, and phones and internet. In modern media and yeah, is... The ability to train your attention span. Yes. You know? A lot of that comes from, we talked about it. Would you have constant action? You become numb to it. 
And I feel like that is what happens with kids today and the media they consume. When you think about it, if you constantly shove media that has constant action and wacky, kooky, you know, things in front of them, they're going to become numb to it and they're going to want to fill it even more and even more and even more. And that's how attention spans get so short. But if you introduce to the media that knows how to stop, rest, look at the scenery, take it in, breathe, just breathe. breathe. Da, 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 da. They, they'll learn. Kids are smart. And that was a movie that was super high energy. Wait, that was a trailer for which one? Last yeah. Jedi or? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. The Rise of Skywalker was way, way like there was no emptiness in that movie. None, <laughs> the, none that at was all. was blazing fast. Uh, that, that's another topic, but yeah, I definitely think that that is something that is sorely missed in film, and it's one of the things that I uphold so high with Ghibli movies. Hayao Miyazaki is not the only one to do this because while he he is the best filmmaker of Ghibli. Other films like Whisper of the Heart. I talked to you about that in depth um, in some of our previous episodes. That movie handles it so well, too. Whisper of the Heart does the same thing. And there's even a movie called Tales of Earthsea, which is considered one of the darker Ghibli movies. But they do the same thing. They just they believe that you don't have to constantly throw something at a kid to keep their attention. They'll look like they'll watch what's on the screen. And you're showing them that it's okay to take in their environment and to just calm down. And then, okay, now we're going to move on to this journey. It teaches patience. I agree. We're missing that. You have to trust that they care enough. And we mentioned this when we were talking about the Batman. I'm going back to the Batman. Of course. It's a much slower movie and it's a long movie, but it's so interesting it's good it's engaging yeah it's very very interesting and it's another movie that doesn't feel its length and this movie's like that i wasn't waiting for an action scene i wasn't expecting an action scene or anything like that like it it set a tone from the beginning i kind of knew what i was getting myself into with how it was paced and in my mind i just thought there like when you brought up action or when you said action i'm like oh yeah there's not really Anything like that. And I made the joke about boss fights and stuff, but I wasn't expecting to see a fight ever. It's just not yeah. that kind of movie. But it was very interesting with what it did. What's really interesting is I'm trying to think of like movies that have action. The movie prior to this, Princess Mononoke, has action. It has fight scenes and um, battles and things like that, but it's it's very well done. Like just by like me saying that doesn't mean that it's not good. It's considered one of the greatest, if not like as great, until this movie came out. Um, and Princess Mononoke took such a long time for him to make Miyazaki that he was actually going to retire after Mononoke. And then, so and that's where, like, he went on vacation with his family and those friends. And I'm he was like, ah. He, he was, like, kicking back on a beach somewhere just ready to hang up the towel and be like, I've done. And this is back in 97. He's still making movies. Um, he was like, yeah, I'm ready to just retire, move on. And then he got inspired and started drawing Chihiro and was like, all right, let's 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 make this movie. And he's still making movies because he he's looking around and he's like, I have to give the people real anime. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave them he, with this trash <laughs> that they have. No, I need to give them an escape. I need to show them the real anime. There, it's it's how old is he right now? He's already. It's really sad because he's eighty one, and in a he's working on a movie right now called How Do You Live. And he's making it as a present to his grandson. Miyazaki has a very complicated history with his own family. Because while he is this great figure in film, he's not as great a figure as a father. He's known to continually neglect his sons because he was always working. He was always animating, drawing, always at the office. His it's a demanding his, job his, like that of your time. And energy. 
Exactly. One of his sons, Goro Miyazaki, got into animation and later got a job with Studio Ghibli just to spend time with his father. Just so he could feel closer to him. And then he experienced the ultimate sadness when he pitched the film Tales of Earthsea, which is another Ghibli film. And his own father rejected it and said, you know, you're not a filmmaker. You're not good. This is not a good movie. What? What's up with that? Yeah, he because Miyazaki had a standard. He was very strict when it came to animation and when it came to how the Ghibli films were made. And so with Goro, his son, who wanted to, who was making these films, Hayao Miyazaki basically told his son, you're not good enough to do this. But Goro Miyazaki pushed through it and made the movie. It wasn't as successful as other Ghibli films, but it was still like it's one of Davies' favorites. Like it's still a good movie, but there you is notice? a rift between. Yeah, you notice. You definitely notice. I mean, I mean, at least for me, who pays attention to what is and isn't Miyazaki, like I notice. But how did he I get it made? Kind of... How did it pass by his his uh, stamp of approval? The other executives at Studio Ghibli felt that it was a good, um, what's the term? Good enough. It was a good opportunity for Goro Miyazaki to make his name. And they sympathized with him. A lot of the people, Studio Ghibli started off as a small team. So a lot of the executives there are like family. And they felt that Goro should should be able to prove himself and to still make the movie. And the... Tales of Ursi is based off of a book and the author of that book was like, hey, I thought and like they had already gotten an agreement with her to make the movie. So if they had canceled this movie, they would never be able to work with her. And this was a movie that they worked to get the licensing for. So they were like, we can't just throw it away. We're still going to make it. And then Hayao Miyazaki's like, okay, well, you're going to make it without me. And so that's what ended up happening. Wow. And it caused, a, it caused a rift in that family. So Cut to now, he is working... Like, there was an interview where he said he was working on, uh, like, better establishing his his family and his life. And he's gotten really close to his grandson. And one of the things that he said was that this movie, How Do You Live?, is going to be a gift to his grandson as a way of saying... Where's the quote? Grandpa is getting ready to leave this world, but he's going to leave behind this film for you. Is, is this going to be his last movie? This is his last movie. And it's it's kind of up in the air if, he, if he's even going to finish it. It was supposed to be completed by 2020. But then in an interview with NHK, which is the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, uh Miyazaki said that the film was not going to be expected anytime soon he said in a quote I used to produce 10 minutes of animation every month but now at, at my old man's speed I'm reduced to one minute of animation done per month what when Hayao Miyazaki works on a movie he does almost everything he does the drawing the story the script he works on it himself what does it and then brings it. He directs his movies. Tells them what frames go where and the characters' decisions and things like that. He does what what people help him with is like coloring because he'll do the sketches and the drawings, but then when it comes to like the water painting and like the backgrounds that you see and the music, that's done by other people. But he does the storyboarding and he does the script. So now he's down to one minute a month? Mm-hmm. Because he says he's too old. Wow. This could be a good father-son bonding moment. It could be. It definitely could be. To help him out. There's a, there is a film that Studio Ghibli did called Earwig and the Witch. It came out in 2020. And Miyazaki wanted to do that film. And in a way, it was kind of a father-son bonding because he, he wanted to make Earwig, and then he also wanted to make How Do You Live? How Do You Live is the present to his grandson. But he knew he wasn't going to have time to have both. 
So in a bury the hatch kind of move, his son, Goro Miyazaki, said, you know what? I'll do your wig. You focus on how do you live. So, yeah, that's what happened. He said, but wait, I don't want you to mess up my movie. <laughs> I want two good movies instead of one good movie. I want like I want to make sure this movie is good. <laughs> I'd rather have two unfinished movies than one good one and one bad one. <laughs> I think he's learned to not be as critical because, yeah, the earwig movie was not good. Wow. <laughs> Tainting the brand. I'm sorry, Goro. So from what I'm hearing, he hasn't made a good movie yet. Yeah. It, it depends on Tales of Earthsea and what you think of that. What do the people think of that? <laughs> the, the good anime watchers of this world, what do they think? I mean... I thought it was okay. Davy likes it, but it had a. Hmm. I'm trying to find it on Rotten Tomatoes. Here we go. It has a 43%. What? It's terrible. Tomatoes. And it was given a 5.7 out of 10. 43%? The... That's rotten. So, and the thing is, is too, is he kind of he kind of topped himself because in a in a bad way. This movie, Tales of Ursi, was the worst rated Ghibli film. Until Earwig, which came out in 2020, <laughs> that he like topped himself in worst Ghibli movie. All right, maybe his dad might be onto something. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Goro. Wow, wow. I don't know what to say. I mean, you do want to keep a certain standard for your movies. It's hard. It's hard to separate that business and family thing yeah. when it comes to something like a movie. And I think because Hayao Miyazaki is so passionate about the movie industry, then his son comes along and tries to, I guess, he's trying to, you know, get on his father's good side, trying to connect with his dad, but he doesn't have that inkling. He doesn't have that uh, just overall talent. You know, the not spending your time with kids and, and and all that, that's 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 another conversation and that's a personal conversation. But yeah, I do somewhat agree when it comes to the business and the quality of these movies, you can't just say yes and go with the flow on running the business just because it's your family. If if it's mm -hmm. if it's something you can improve on. You know, if they're not up to snuff, then I think you do have to call that out. I think so too. I think especially like this isn't a this isn't a family business in in the overall sense. It's a film. It's a film business. Yeah. So you gotta you gotta take that in mind whenever you're making stuff like this. But yeah, Hayao Miyazaki has standards. When he attended the private screening of Tales of Earthsea. Like, he, Goro wanted to show his father, like, this is what I did. Oh, no. <laughs> all, all he said was he felt like, what was it? here's the line. He says, I felt like I was looking at my kid at a school play. He's not an adult yet. He's my son. That is all. <laughs> and how old is he at the time? At, his, at the time, his son was like 40-something. <laughs> He's not an adult yet. <laughs> I will put this movie uh, on my fridge. Very cute attempt. Ex exactly. Exactly. Just a crayon drawing of macaroni, the poster of the movie. Macaroni. Macaroni. <laughs> glue project. What's crazy is the year prior, like, Hayao Miyazaki worked on Howl's Moving Castle, which is just, ah, uh, that's my favorite movie. And the year after that is Tales of Earthsea. And it's like, come on, man. How do you not see what your father's cooking up in the workshop? I feel like I'm walking away with a lot more knowledge. Knowledge. At some point, we're going to have to watch Tales of Earthsea. Not not for the pod, but I think it would be interesting just to see how different it is from Miyazaki's films. There's there's a difference. You can tell. I'm definitely up for watching more. Like This was such an interesting conversation. I don't know. I was thinking about it. I don't know how much I would have enjoyed it on my own. I'm sure it still would have been very good. But um, yeah, and I don't know if I'm going to seek them out on my own, but I am interested enough to watch more to talk about them because it does bring up a lot of interesting thoughts for me. It does. So, yeah, I am definitely for watching more Studio Ghibli. I'm so glad. I thought 
I had a I had a nightmare. I think like two or three a days awake, ago. Half awake, half asleep nightmare. After we talked about like, okay, we're gonna do Spirit Away. I had a, I think that night I had a nightmare that we finished watching it, and then you were like, "All right, you ready to record?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Okay, Caroline, I hope you have a lot of good things to say about this movie because I don't." And I was like, "Yeah." Duh. I would have started like that. I'll be like, "All right, Caroline, why did we watch this movie?" Yeah, <laughs> that's how I know you think it's a. <laughs> that you didn't really like the movie you're like caroline why did we watch this movie and i was like oh no. that's not true i think i said that for a movie i liked actually why did we watch this movie i can't remember but yeah you definitely said i can't that. remember either but just in in dream dream tone yeah was like uh i i didn't like this and i was like uh. i wonder if i had good points in that dream I don't know, because I was so sad that I woke up. <laughs> you were wo- awoken by sadness? <laughs> I was. Your eyes were globbing tears? <laughs> I was big, fat tears like Chihiro yeah. when she ate the That's rice. That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. I was just like... Mm. <laughs> Your pillows were just soaked, and you woke up because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it was That explains. <laughs> I woke up because it was all wet, and my face was all Did filled you with salty out your pillows? tears. Salty I had to yeah. put it in the dryer. <laughs> I had a dream it was Spirited Away Day. And that's why we're doing this. <laughs> Spirited Away has been in the dreams. Yeah. That was a weird one, though. Today is Spirited Away Day. Let me tell the listeners. Actually- let me let them in on this. Have yeah. you Have you guys ever had a dream where you're half awake and half asleep and it feels real? It feels like something that really happened. And then when you actually wake up, you have to confirm that it happened or not. That's what we were talking about before the pod. And my half awake, half asleep dream was I thought it was Spirited Away Day, like a national holiday or something. Like you, I checked my Google calendar and it says like St. Patrick's Day or Fourth of July. It said Spirited Away Day in my dream. And then I had to wake <laughs> up and, and type in on Google Spirited Away Day. I typed that in. I really did. I typed in Spirited Away Day and it just <laughs> Spirited Away came up, not day. And like, all right. Yeah, of course it's not real. What was I thinking? I wish it was. I think there's a. Is there a Ghibli Day? Probably. And I thought it was real because there really are those days. You know, it's like Best Friends Day, Dog Day, Hot Dog Day, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Not national there, holidays, but you know how each day has something now? I don't know who yeah, made this Yeah, there's up. like a, there's a national coffee day. Oh, that's every day for you. Oh. <laughs> for sure. Heck yeah. But on national coffee day, uh, I go out and get a coffee. Oh, you, you make October it special. October 1st. Yeah, of course it's October. Of course. <laughs> of course. But yeah, you know, things like that. And I'm like. That that that's what got me convinced that there probably is a spirited away day, but no, there I, isn't. I, there isn't, but I feel like there needs to be at least a Ghibli day. Everybody set aside and watch one Ghibli movie. Yeah, there needs to be because the Ghibli films. I'm so glad that they are popular and that they are regarded as they are because it would be something if they were underrated classics. But I'm glad that a lot of people recognize that these films or people who have seen these films are like, oh yeah, these are something special. All of them bring something different to the table, and yet they feel so refreshing to watch in their own ways. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, in the future, watching more of these films with you. Because if Spirit Away really is the tip of the iceberg. And I really think that the more Ghibli you watch, the more you're going to be impressed by these styles. The tip of of the iceberg as in the crown jewel, right? According to James Gunn. Yes, this movie is the crown jewel. It can't get better than this. I will say that. Right? They're all good. This is just the best one. Well, we will watch more Studio Ghibli. I promise you that. We will. Not next week, though. Not next week. Next week, we got but plans. In the future. Yeah. In the future, we will. We have our movie decided for next week, right? Absolutely. It's set. Set game match. What is it? Let them know. Next week's movie is Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Oh, man. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that's going to be good. It's going to be so good. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Me too. Well, all right. Is there anything we missed in this conversation? Any last any last words you want to say about uh, Spirited Away or just anything that's in your mind? I had a little bit of uh, trivia dump in my brain. Oh, but okay. 
I'll do I'll do a little bit. I just wanted the listeners to know that. So Beauty and the Beast came out in 1991, made such a splash on the film industry in terms of what animation could accomplish and convey. So the Academy Awards in 2001 opened up and created the category of Best Animated Feature. The first of that Oscar, the the first Best Animated Feature Oscar, was awarded to Shrek and rightfully deserved. (laughs) However, the year after that, Spirited Away was nominated. It was completely unusual that, first of all, a, a foreign film would be nominated for best animated picture and then uh an an like a, a japanese film like an anime think about an anime movie being nominated for american best... oscars yeah uh, yeah for the american oscars and so not only that but i mean to be fair the what's it called the competition wasn't as steep the other films competing it with with it were like ice age Lilo and Stitch, Treasure Planet, which is a good movie, but it's not Spirit Away. And Spirit, which is a horse movie from DreamWorks. Yeah, I haven't heard anything really competitive. Exactly. So, but Spirit Away was the second film, second animated film ever to win an Oscar. And I'm glad that it was acknowledged for that. It also was the highest grossing animated movie in japan it was until two years ago it was passed up by the anime movie demon slayer just and recently? that's really just very recently yeah it was the highest grossing animated movie in japan wow it took that long it took that long to top it yeah wow a demon slayer i haven't seen it but i'm sure it's not that good i'm sure it's just popularity it's a good like it it's good but it's not you saw the movie? away I have not seen the movie. I'm talking about, the uh, but movie. I'm saying like, I'm. I saw the show, and I'm sure just, the show is good. I have no doubt. But the movie, I don't know if it. I, I I think the numbers, the the money came from popularity alone. Yeah, I think there's also to be adjusted for like inflation and things like that. So just think about how big this movie made it in Japan that it was very recently passed up. Right, that's what I'm thinking. This movie is like over 20 years old. It's con- it's this movie has accolades that are also beyond that. Roger Ebert has a list of greatest movies. This is on it. Uh, Steven Schneider, who's another film critic, said that this film is part of the 1001 movies you must see before you die. Like this movie made such a splash. Yeah, I up that list. I've, I've looked at that list. It's really good. Shrek we'll is to... on there. I think Shrek <laughs> is on there. <laughs> Is Zack Snyder's Justice League on there? No, these are uh, a lot of these films are a little bit older. Okay, but this this list was made maybe in like the mid two thousands. I hope Spider Man's on there. I wonder for Spider Man. I'm looking at the but list. Yeah, that's right now. quite a feat because I can't think of a Disney movie that's out around that time. But you know, that's like if that's Treasure Planet. But yeah. Ah. Uh, 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 mm. Exactly. Let's say Toy Story. Let's say if Toy Story was still held the title for highest animated movie over here mm-hmm. in the States. I mean, just after, the year after Finding Nemo came out. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Wow. So that's interesting. They had just missed that overlap. But yeah, let's take a look at that list after this. I'm interested. There's a couple of other things too. Um, what was it? The real title? Of Spirit Away. Spirit Away is the American title. In Japan, it's Sen to Chihiro no Kami Kakushi, which means Sen and Chihiro's Spiriting Away. Spirited Away is a much better title. Spirited Away is the shortened version of this. And is much better. (laughs) Come on. How does that sound interesting at all? I mean, if you're if you're a, a native Japanese speaker, that probably does hit you better than just like in english it's like spirited away i don't know it probably makes more sense if you're a japanese speaker yeah there's another lost in translation no i don't have to mention that one but yeah just that chihiro and sen they both mean 1000 
uh, I think I already said that. Oh, the cut the line one. I thought that was really funny because when Hayao Miyazaki was telling his animators, oh, we, we're going to animate the scene. Cut the line. You know, you make your your fingers, your, yeah. your forefinger and your thumb into a circle and then somebody has to cut it down the middle. The voice actress of Chihiro told Hayao Miyazaki, I don't know what this is. What do you mean? Like, what what is this? What's this concept? And Hayao Miyazaki said, young people know nothing these days. <laughs> and he <laughs> said it as a joke. A but <laughs> I was like, what a boomer. I thought that was such a funny <laughs> quote. <laughs> I, again, more things I agree with. <laughs> Another thing was a lot of people thought that, that the bathhouse was actually a brothel. Um, that was a oh. first assumption when that movie came out. But that was a rumor that Hayao Miyazaki quickly refuted and said, absolutely not. He makes his films for kids and he would not put anything like that near children. Only cigarettes and blood. That's where he draws the <laughs> line. Cigarettes and blood is where he draws the line, not brothels. But that was a, that was like a, a firsthand like assumption when this movie came out. You see, and I was just guessing that it was hell. I, I didn't say brothel. Your take on this movie is so interesting. I never would have thought that. When I first saw this movie, I did not think of hell. It seems like the obvious go-to. I'm surprised you haven't heard that before. <laughs> uh-uh. it, it was so interesting to me from that point of view as I was watching. Hell? Yeah, and, and how people... And again, I'm telling you like from different... You know, people have different interpretations of hell. Yeah. Like the lake of fire and like eternal suffering and all that. But then there's the, the other hell of like, you don't really know you're in hell. And it's like a, a subtle suffering. And it's kind of like the good place. Remember the good place? Yeah. Yeah. But you re- you remember that, that preacher I told you about that he interpreted the story of like Lazarus and, and the, the beggar? Mm-hmm. Um, he interpreted it differently where like there was a moment where the beggar was begging for water like well, lazarus is yeah lazarus is the beggar oh, it was the rich man. yeah the rich man yeah i'm sorry i mixed them where you, you remember when he was begging for water and to like mm-hmm. just to, to be dipped in a cup of water and he'll just like take the drips from the um just from the fingertips and mm-hmm. he interpreted it as like he's not even he's not even begging to be let out of hell he, he's just begging for for water like he he's not even re- he doesn't even realize that he's suffering in hell. And that's the way that he took it. And I'm like, is this is this a different take on that? Is this people just working and they're so focused on the work they have to do that they don't realize that they're in a, a hamster wheel that, you know, they can never escape? It's definitely possible. It's interesting. There's another. Well. There might be some credibility to your theory there's a story in japanese mythology called izanagi and izanami and these are two gods in japan mythology that are married izanami dies and has to go to hell which is their world of death izanagi which is her husband wants to go and rescue her but in that tale he's told to walk forward and never look back when he leaves when he oh, leaves hell, that. it's yeah, walk forward, walk out, and don't turn around. Never look back. And that is what Haku tells Chihiro when she's leaving the spirit world. Look at that. Look at that. Here's my pro tip for all of you who are leaving a, a hellish place and they're they tell you not to look back. We <laughs> your job. We now have cameras. So you just put it on a selfie mode and then just oh like my take gosh. a quick peek what's going on behind you. <laughs> That counts. <laughs> you're not looking back. Tell me you are. You're seeing what's behind you, but you're not looking back. You know what I mean? Technically, you are. You're not looking back. You know, you just so happen to see what's behind you. Technically, you are. Oh, and my last thing was Haku in the English. They just said his name is Kohaku River. In Japanese, his name is Niki Hayama Kohaku Nushi, which is actually a god name because it has a nigi and in front of it so there's and also there's a shinto god in japanese culture named nigi haya nigi hayahi so his name is an homage to that and that's also like another 
implication where Japanese people, like Jap- people who watch the Japanese version understood it as Kohaku would be able to go back. Cause that would mean his power level is on the same level as that river spirit that they cleansed. Mm-hmm. You know, so that would be another reason for him to be able to go back and kind of usurp Yubaba. Would you look at that? See, I think I'm done with my lore dump. Thank you for letting me fan out a little bit on that. I, I hope, you, yeah, I hope you're not missing anything. I hope so too. I mean, we I'm will revisit Studio and... Ghibli for sure, but I just think absolutely. And this isn't the last time we'll talk about Spirit Away. As we watch more Ghibli films down the road, I'm sure I'll think of something. But okay, I finished my notes. But for now, you're content. For now, I am content. Same here. Everybody, thank you so much for listening i know i always say this at the end but at this point it's just the staple if you stuck around this long give us a like it subscribe hit the bell icon if you're listening to us on youtube and if you're listening to us on spotify or any other podcasting platform of your choice hit give a follow if you want to hear more from us and turn on some notifications while you're at it maybe and if you want leave us an honest review thank you all so much for listening thank you very much have a good night and free the soot